everybody to this World Affairs Council flash briefing on COVID and the elections. I'm Charles Shapiro, president of the World Affairs Council. We're exactly four weeks from election day and we have the vice presidential debate tomorrow night. This is, I think, the first time in 230 years since the constitution was adopted that we're holding elections in the midst of a pandemic. The Joint Chiefs of Staff are quarantining. This morning, Twitter blocked a tweet from Mr. Trump about COVID, which Twitter considers misleading. New York Times has a headline with Biden touting masks and science while Trump downplays risks. The president's illness redefines the campaign. So we asked three experts to help us sort this out. Dr. Amy Baxter is a physician, a former ER doctor, a medical researcher, and an entrepreneur. Neil Kinkoff is a professor of law at the GSU College of Law, an expert on both the amendment and on transitions. And Dr. Amy Steigerwall is a professor of political science, not an MD, at Georgia State University. She's a political analyst and a regular panelist on Georgia Public Broadcasting's Political Rewind show. I want to welcome, we've got some people who are joining us. I want to welcome the Consul General of France, Vincent Omaril, Oid Verma from my board of directors. He's the CEO of Crawford and Company, Ambassador Michael Skoll, my former boss, and Melissa Wahabi from the Foreign Press Center in New York. Uh, in a few minutes, we're gonna start taking questions from the audience. Please send them to me using the Q&A function on the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please make your questions short and polite, I underline polite, and use your name if you send them anonymously, I will not ask them. Let me start by saying that I, and I think all of us at the World Affairs Council are pleased that the president is recovering from COVID. Whether we are supporters or opponents, we all hope that he and Mrs. Trump, and in fact, all of the 42,223 Americans who contracted COVID yesterday recover quickly. Let me start with you, Dr. Amy Baxter. Today's New York Times says President Trump is trying to make the COVID seem like a minor inconvenience. Is COVID a minor inconvenience for most patients? No. No, the 200,009 people, 209,000 people who have passed away, certainly it was not a minor inconvenience. But the biggest issue now is that people who are infected with COVID, between 10 and 30% are having long-term serious complications. Everything from heart issues with cardiomyopathy, so inflammation of the heart tissue, to prolonged fatigue. So for the people who catch it, even those who get better, it's not a minor inconvenience at all. It's a significant part of our public health landscape for the next decade at least. Neil, you're, you're the expert in the 25th Amendment. Should the president have transferred power to the vice president while he was in Walter Reed? Well, I think the answer to that question depends on just how sick he was while he was in Walter Reed. And I don't think we really have a good, a good idea of just how sick he was. So the 25th Amendment provides that when the president is unable to perform the powers and duties of the office, he can temporarily hand that over to the vice president, who for the period is, the, is designated as the acting president. Um, this has happened somewhat routinely, starting with President Reagan, when presidents have been admitted to the hospital for procedures that require anesthesia. I don't think President Trump had the equivalent of anesthesia, but it certainly, if he was in, well, if he was physically incapacitated, then the practice would have been for him to, to transfer the power. But uh, it's, it's really, I'm, I'm in no position to know just what kind of shape he was in. But that, that's, a, that's his decision, not somebody else's decision, am I right? Well, primarily it's his decision, right? That's what the 25th Amendment contemplates, although there is a mechanism where the president um, doesn't turn over power if the vice president and a majority of the, the cabinet officers agree that the president is unable, then the vice president can make a declaration that has the consequence of positioning him as the acting president. Uh, Amy Steigerwald, has 
COVID become the defining issue of the campaign? Yes, and really, I think it has been from since in January when we had the first inklings of where it was going to come to be. And it really offered President Trump an opportunity to sort of craft a path forward to show his ability uh, to sort of act as president, to show leadership on this issue, to take control of a sort of very broad issue that has far reaching ramifications, right? It's not just the public health impacts, obviously, due to our response to it. There's also been sort of economic uh, issues, whether or not kids are in school, all of these various things. And no matter what the president did, his actions were going to be judged. And no matter who the president was, his actions were going to be judged during this election year, right? So the fact that it happened during the election year meant that it was going to become an election issue. And the fact that it's still continuing means that it's even more of an election issue and one where, um, unfortunately for the president, he is not faring well in the public's view as to how he is handling the crisis, um, either whether it's broadly for the country or in polls that were released actually late last night and early this morning of how he's even handled it for himself and um, how the White House is handling it since he's been diagnosed. So, uh, Boris Johnson got a, got a bump in the polls in the UK when he came down with COVID, you're saying President Trump, there's no bump for Trump. So we might have imagined a similar thing would happen. That's what we call the rally around the flag effect, that people, when there is some sort of crisis or threat to the leadership or to the country itself, that we sort of rally around and want to show support. I think what has differed here are a few things. Number one, that already this issue had been sort of politicized and that there were very partisan responses to it. I think that was the first issue. I think the second one was in comparison with Prime Minister Johnson and his staff, they were actually fairly forthcoming about what was going on. Um, and we also saw that basically getting sick and then particularly after he was hospitalized led to sort of a humbling of uh, the Prime Minister's response to what was going on and to the response of government as well. We haven't seen that as much here. And as I said, what's sort of notable about a lot of the polls that are coming out are this response of a number of people saying that the president, for example, hasn't taken, 72% uh, in this poll that was just conducted said that he did not take appropriate precautions. There are uh, also almost uh, two thirds are saying that he has not shown leadership on this issue or set out a good game plan. And these are results that came out, as I said, last night and this morning in a couple of separate polls. And what's perhaps most striking is that those numbers are um, high even within Republicans and very, very high with independents and Democrats. Um, I think the other one that's notable is that what has actually changed since the president was diagnosed um, and his response to it, I think, is also the fact that he has responded in some ways of still wanting to kind of downplay the virus. Um, it did not play well when he went on a ride with the Secret Service agents to sort of wave at the things. And so I think that's in part why we also are seeing that same poll that's showing that. We're also seeing a really big uptick almost entirely among Republicans of how personally concerned people are now about whether or not they will contract the virus. So in that sense, we have seen a shift that I would say uh, public health experts would probably say is positive that people are now taking that much more seriously, but that's not resulting in a, um, that is not then suggesting that they are giving Trump uh, credit for that and why it is that they're having that response. Amy Baxter, the White House has been using uh, Abbott Labs rapid test. It's an antigen test to keep the president safe. And obviously it didn't. What, what went wrong? What were they doing wrong? Well, it's not what they were doing wrong. It's what a test is supposed to do. A test is like an alarm system. It can let you know if someone's sneaking around, but it's not going to stop them from getting in. So just like an alarm system, you've got two different ends of testing. You can either be expecting the situation to be very chaotic, like an outdoor alarm, or it can be something when you don't expect there to be much at all, like an indoor, any movement at all sets it off. So the context of your test makes a huge difference. The Abbott test is actually designed 
for patients who have been symptomatic between one and seven days. So what that means is it's calibrated for a, a pretty big storm of virus, but mm -hmm. they're using it for an indoor situation when people don't have symptoms and aren't sick yet. The other thing is even at its best, tests are gonna err on one side of being too sensitive or missing things. And so the Abbott test picks up ill people 95% of the time, according to the company, and between 60 and 70% according to it being used in the field. So a couple things wrong. One thing is you can't use a test to protect anybody. You're gonna have people who are early in the course of the disease. You're gonna have the test being used wrong. You're going to have the, the timing be such that they don't have enough virus yet to find it. And the test itself is just not designed to be that sensitive. So using a test of any sort is a bad strategy, but using one that's calibrated for people with symptoms is not going to identify at least 5% and even up to 30% of people who have just gotten sick or are asymptomatic. So they're, they're asymptomatic, but contagious. But infectious, but infectious. infectious we know, thank yeah, 40% 40, 40 of people um, and more, the more mask wearing they use are going to be infectious, but not have any signs of being ill. That's one of the insidious things about this virus compared to other viruses like SARS or MERS or the 1918 pandemic. The um, event, I want to say it was September 26, but two Saturdays ago at the White House where they introduced the new Supreme Court nominee. Was that a super spreader event? Yeah, by definition, it was a super spreader event. So we now know that about 80% of cases are caused by 20% of people. You know, the classic 80-20 rule also works for spreading coronavirus. So a new paper just came out that found that the people most likely to spread are those who are older and who are obese and who are ill with any kind of virus. Are you so, talking about me? None of them apply to you. Okay. Um, so, so because of that, and since we know that at least eight people became ill, it probably wasn't in those huggy pictures that we're seeing of Kellyanne Conway and Attorney General Barr on the lawn. It's probably in those closed door, indoor circumstances that people were around each other more than 15 minutes. There's probably somebody at that point that did the spreading. Neil, um, you know, so now with th I think three Republican senators have tested positive. Um, presumably, I mean, not just senators, but at the whole level from county governments to, to, to federal level, there are candidates who are becoming ill. What, what happens in the United States when a, if a candidate has to drop out this close to the election? Is there a standard? Is there a law that applies? There are many laws that apply. That's sort of the problem is it's up to the law of each state. Mm -hmm. So... Um, you raised the Senate. I think maybe it's a little simpler to talk about. Then it depends on what state the senator is from. Um, you know, we can think about the president. Um, and here we think about both President Trump and former Vice President Biden, because President or former Vice President Biden can also get sick between now of course. and the election. Right? So this is a, a generic point. Um, the law in Georgia provides that if a candidate dies, between now and the election, there's a mechanism for the for the Georgia par party affiliate, so Republican or Democratic, depending on which one, um, to fill the vacancy. And it would depend on when the death occurs. If it occurs up to 10 days before the election, then the um, political party holds a convention and delegates of the executive committees of each council attend the convention and choose a replace a substitute um, nominee. If it happens in the last six days before the election, then, um, or I'm sorry, if it happens within the last 10 days before the election, then um, the state party executive committee simply designates somebody. Uh, um, but, you, that, but at that point, you can't change the ballot. I mean, so you're voting for not only can the you, vote votes for deceased candidate X count for new candidate Y, right? So not only can you not change the ballot, but um, some votes will have already been cast, right? Early sure. voting starts next week, so um, we'll be we'll be at the point where some of those votes have already been cast. And what happens really it varies from state to state. 
um, as to as to how that gets treated. And so, if if a presidential candidate were to be in that position of dying between now and the time of the election, it would just be legal chaos breaking out. Amy Steigerwald. Uh, must have been seven, eight weeks ago, we had a program with Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger. What's your assessment on the job that he is doing, getting ready for November 3rd? Um, so what's interesting in the state of Georgia and why it makes it a little hard to answer that decision is that we have an incredibly decentralized system of handling elections. There's very little that actually happens from the Secretary of State office. Um, so the Secretary of State was there to, for example, make the decision on getting the new electronic voting machines, right, the ones that we have now that have the printed ballots, so that was held, and doing trainings for that. That, during the primary, we know there were some concerns with. There were a number of machines that had to come in, there were some issues on working, there were issues with training. Thankfully, we've had time between the primary and now to fix that. A lot of other things, though, are all handled by each of the counties. Georgia has 159 counties, so there are 159 different heads of elections in each of those counties who have control over ballots, sending out of ballots, verifying signatures, because remember that's still on the books as well, uh, verifying signatures both on ballots as well as uh, verifying signatures at the day at the polls. Um, it is also the county election officials who are responsible for contacting those who have sent in absentee ballots and letting people know if they have an issue with their ballot and if there's something that needs to be corrected on it. And finally, they're the ones who are responsible for uh, collating the ballots, right? So both taking in requests for ballots, but then also counting them when we have it. And so a lot of the issues that we have seen, unfortunately, really sort of resided in the counties as opposed to um, at the state level. I will say that I think where Raffensperger uh, did a nice job was during uh, the primaries in particular of sending out the ballot applications to all registered voters um, as a political scientist who of course would like as many people to vote as possible. Um, I wish that had been done for the federal, for, the, for this election, for the, for the general election, but um, I will say that the new, the new website, once it went live, is very easy to use for people to request um, at their absentee ballot and get it sent to them. Um, but where we've seen, so for example, Fulton County had quite a lot of issues. Um, and again, that was one thing where there was um, a lot of efforts brought in, the state even coming in to ensure. Uh, so there was a creation, that's why they came up with more polling places. So if anybody listening is in Fulton County, check. Uh, they added about 60 new polling places. And so almost everyone needs to go somewhere different. And so we saw a lot of adjustments made like that, but. What does make it difficult is that, again, all of those decisions, almost all of them, are handled, in fact, at the local level, at the county level, rather than statewide. So all the people who are angry with Ravensburger, in fact, ought to direct a lot of that anger towards uh, the county elect elections official in the county where they reside. Definitely. So it depends on what the topic is. There are certain yeah. things to be upset with when it comes to the voting machines. That's actually handled at the state level. So people being trained on the machines, making sure there's enough technicians out to make sure that they're working, that's all handed at the state level. Um, the issues that we saw with people not receiving their absentee ballots, particularly during the primaries, those were almost all county level problems. And I, I was one of those who never got the ballot, by the way. So Amy, uh, other Amy, Amy Baxter, let me ask you this. So uh, in-person voting starts on Monday. Um, if I had not, Actually, I did receive my absentee ballot for the general election, thank goodness. But if I had not received it and I wanted to go vote in person, how do I vote and stay safe? Sure. Well, there's a couple things. First of all, you vote early because the lines on election day are going to be insane, which means that the amount of time that you're standing in close proximity to someone or even standing out in the cold and getting uh, more at risk of getting flu, those are to be avoided. So going early is going to have a lower density of people, which is going to make a difference. Now, if you really want to go the full best way you can get protected, first thing is you've already should have gotten your flu shot because there's data that just having a flu shot is actually protective against severe coronavirus or getting it at all. 
and we're not sure why, but there's a couple other vaccines that also seem to globally limit other viruses. You'd want to get that two weeks in advance, so it's too late if you're going to go on the 12th, but you can certainly vote now and then early vote on the 19th. Yeah. Um, second thing is the week before, get your immune system as boosted as possible. So particularly with coronavirus, what has been found effective, um, exercise, vitamin D levels up to snuff, zinc, melatonin, which is antiviral, who knew, um, and as much sleep as you need. So getting a few days of sleep beforehand, that's good. Uh, it'd be great if you get a coronavirus test one or two days before, if it's coming back soon enough, so you don't infect anybody else when you go. Mm -hmm. And since we now have CDC confirmation of what we've expected for quite some time, it's aerosol transmitted, which means that if you're going to be in an enclosed room that doesn't have a lot of airflow, then you want to avoid inhaling aerosols through your nose because that's where coronavirus initially gets into your body in almost every case. So, I mean, it, you can use a little uh, swimming nose clip here. And obviously on the day of, you're gonna want to um, wear the mask and keep it over your nose because that's the place that is the most important. And finally, this is something that I'm investigating and so are about 12 other people around the globe, but it seems that using either preventative intranasal betadine spray, using nasal irrigation afterwards, um, there are a couple other different kinds of ways to clear out the virus from the nose, but the virus doesn't stick into your nose very easily. It takes a long time to get in. So if you can rinse it out one way or the other, that's another way, if you think you might have been exposed, to be as safe as possible. Is there a website with all this? I mean, I, we, I, I did a video on it on a, a Pain Care Labs YouTube channel. But you send me the link and we'll send it to everybody who's will, on this. I will, I will send it. It's, uh, it's complicated, but at least there are some evidence-based ways to help. Neil, it looks like, it looks like both parties are preparing for court battles in states where there are close elections. How, how do you do that ahead of time? How do you get ready? And, and how, how does it actually work? What, do you go to federal court? You go to state court? Um, where, where, do you, where do you do these battles? The battles will proceed in both federal and state court. Um, certainly, if Bush versus Gore is any, is any indication, there were battles in both federal and state court. And people may remember that those battles came through Atlanta because the federal appeals courts in Florida that were handling those challenges, I mean, the, the trial courts in Florida, the appeals court for that is the 11th Circuit here in Atlanta, and then it went up to the, went up to the Supreme Court. Um, in that case, I don't think there was much advanced preparation, but in this case, I, I think um, that the parties have some sense about where some of the, um, some of the problems are apt to arise, and so they're preparing their challenges. Um, I think in, certainly in the case of President Trump, he's been telling us for some time what he thinks the problems with our voting system are. Um, and, and I've heard um, um, some Republican lawyers talking about the challenges that they plan to, that they expect to see brought. Um, and so those kinds of preparations can, and I'm sure in this instance are, as opposed to last time where it was all very much after the fact. Um, um, and, you know, I think Bush versus Gore is going to, is apt to end up looking like child's play compared to what's, what's apt to go on with this election, because there are so many battleground states where the margins could end up being so close that, you know, Bush versus Gore was pretty well limited to Florida. Um, we could see that replaying across eight or nine different states. Are, are there lawyers, attorneys who, I mean, how do you specialize in that? I mean, you know, you can specialize in all kinds of law. Right. So there certainly are lawyers that specialize in election law, and there are lawyers in virtually every state who, who specialize in election law. There are lawyers here in Georgia who do that um, because there are elections frequently enough that that keeps lawyers in, in good business. Um, it's not a huge component of the bar, but there, there absolutely are lawyers who specialize in that. 
And then there are the lawyers who specialize in practice at the Supreme Court. And I think everyone anticipates that that's where these battles are going. And really, you do need a special expertise to understand how to appeal to those particular justices. Um, so I, I'm sure at every level along the way, lawyers are boning up right now and, and going back and reading old opinions from the judges they're planning to be arguing in front of to see just how, how to appeal to them. So that, we, that brings the question of the confirmation of the latest nominee for the Supreme Court while at the same time you've got senators who are falling ill with COVID, how, 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 does, how does that impact uh, the Supreme Court nomination? It could impact in a couple of different ways. One is um, depending on how widespread and when those illnesses are occurring, it could prevent the Senate Judiciary Committee from having a quorum to report um, Judge Barrett's nomination out to the floor, and that's a necessary step. Um, it could also deprive, depending on who's, which party senators are ill at the time that the, the nomination is being voted on, um, it could prevent there being a majority um, and require, so for example, if Potentially, if only two or three Republicans are infected at the time of the election, because two have said that they don't think that this vote should proceed before the election, that could mean that Senator McConnell would have to delay the vote until after the election. That all then could play into another constitutional mechanism, and that's recess appointments, right? So if this gets pushed until after the election, it could be that President Trump might appoint Judge Barrett uh, by recess appointment, if the Senate is in recess for more than 10 days, um, that that would be a mechanism that's available. Supreme Court justices, at least 15 Supreme Court justices have been given a recess appointment before the Senate acted on their, on their nomination. So it wouldn't be at all unprecedented, um, but it would certainly be extraordinary for a president to appoint a justice at a time when that president's own re-election is one of the issues pending before the Supreme Court. Wow, okay, this is complicated. <laughs> Everybody, everybody's got Googling uh, recess appointment right, right now. <laughs> <laughs> so hey, we'll, get, we'll get to some questions from the audience. Uh, one of them, I'm just gonna answer, it's uh, from an anonymous attendee. Please don't send anonymous questions. Does each county print its own ballots? And the answer is no, they're printed by the Secretary of State's office, even though they do vary obviously from county to county because different offices are up for election in each county. Uh, Amy Steigerwald, Jennifer McCoy, professor of political science at Georgia State University, one of your colleagues asks, do you expect the exact match law to be a problem well, around now, to be a problem this election in rejecting absentee ballots like it was in 2018. And on the other hand, are you worried about a new software patch being added to all the voting machines at the last minute? These are technical issues that are always of concern. So to sort of take the latter one first, um, when it comes to the software patches, there's certainly always issues with that. Um, other things to be perfectly blunt that I'm worried about as someone who wants the elections to go as well is making sure that they have enough power cords. This was an issue last year, uh, sorry, in the 2018 elections that there were a couple of sites that didn't get enough power cords that were delivered. Um, what, what, did you say, you said, you said power cords, extension I cords. did, I said power cords. Wow. Um, I'm also concerned about the people who are supposed to open up the election sites being there on time as well. Uh, the Park Tavern site over in Midtown actually opened late for the special election vote that was held on September 29th in part because the security guard overslept, right? These things happen, they happen a lot. So those are always of concern. And so that's one sort of set of them. Um, with the exact match, um, exact match is in fact the law in Georgia. The ability to determine whether or not a voter signature matches their official signature is a power given to the county board election people. And in many places that really is a almost a single person 
um, especially in some of the smaller counties who has that control. So the best thing I can say on that is that the signature on your driver's license is your official signature. So if you're not sure what your official signature should look like, many of us have sort of different versions that we use, the kind of fast one, the longer one, look on your driver's license because yes, that will be something. Um, another issue will be ensuring that you have filled out the ballot correctly, an issue that occurred um, again back in 2018 were that there were different forms of the ballot envelopes that were sent out that asked for slightly different information on how you fill it out. Make sure you read it carefully. Make sure you are filling out the correct information in the place where you are supposed to, that when it asks for a year that you are able to determine if they're asking for your birth year or if they're asking for the year that you are participating in this election. Each of those things can possibly be used to um, disqualify ballots. And technically you should be given a chance to be able to go correct it, but part of what can happen, and this is where the concerns about sort of absentee ballots and when they're received come in, that the later your absentee ballot is received by the county elections board, the less time you're going to have to be able to correct issues and have it be counted. So that's one of the reasons why turning it in early uh, using the drop boxes that have been put up all around um, in most states is are a really good idea. And do you recommend the drop box over putting it in the mail? Yes. I, I think uh, all intents and purposes, I think the postal service workers are doing everything they can. Um, but the issue is, so for example, in uh, for Georgia law that your ballot must be received by 7 p.m. on election day, right? There was a move to extend that period. It was just uh, shortened again due to a, a court challenge. That means that if you put it in the mail three days ahead of time, it doesn't matter if it's been postmarked, it must be received. We do not mm -hmm. have a postmark date, we have a received date. If you want to ensure it's received, put it in a drop box, or actually you can take it to the Board of Elections as well and turn it in by hand. Okay. Uh, Dr. Baxter, Dr. Laura Dawson wants to know, she says, we want our sons, daughters, and students to be politically engaged, but public demonstrations and meetings during pandemic seem risky. How can people stay safe if they choose to attend political meetings and demonstrations? I'd had her go knocking on doors or talking to potential voters. Are the rules different for young people than they are for older people? So the quick answer is wear a mask and be outside. Um, the, the longer answer is it is seeming that younger people are less likely to be super spreaders. They are less likely if they're not obese to create aerosols that transmit problems in, in outside groups. So protesting indoors rarely carries a lot of impact. So I assume we're talking about outdoors, but the, the outdoor mask wearing is a very safe environment. And to that, um, to that uh, point, the outdoor rallies have not become super spreader events, neither have there been increases associated with the political protests and the justice reform people outside. It's, it's really indoor rallies where there are problems. It is aerosol, it stays indoors. If you're outdoors, it just dissipates. So. Um, stay around uh, thin young people wearing masks and you should be okay. I guess, I, I'm not sure who this is for. It's either for Amy Steigerwald or Neil uh, Kimkoff. Is what, this is from Guy Powell, what percentage of ballots get voided because the signature doesn't match? Are there statistics available online and does it vary or more uh, ballots from one party rejected than from another party? Um, there's, I don't know, Neil. Did you want to answer that one? Or? Um, I don't. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, although, 
Charles, your, your point about does it vary from party to party or place to place could play into the legal challenges we were talking about. That was okay. essentially the, the Bush versus Gore challenge was that the recount standards in some counties were different than the standards in the other counties, which made some which made the weight of people's vote count differently in violation of the one person, one vote principle. So that's a potential legal challenge that's out there. I don't know the statistics, though. Um, I would defer to Amy on that. Yeah, again, the statistics really do vary. Um, they vary very much county by county. So for example, during the 2018 elections, it was Gwinnett County that had a disproportionately high number of absentee ballots that were rejected due to signature match issues. And so that actually resulted in uh, some court challenges that led to increased time to be able to rectify those. But you know, in, in general, the number is somewhere between two to 5%. There doesn't um, we have not seen, I haven't seen a really good breakdown as to, in Georgia, party differentials. Now, I will say, uh, strictly because I know there's people that are listening that are not just in Georgia, uh, North Carolina has actually been doing an excellent job posting every single day how many absentee ballots are received, hmm. how many absentee ballots are rejected, and also giving the breakdowns based upon the party identification of the voter as well as their race. I mean... I learned a, a, a new verb that I had not heard before, and that's curing an absentee ballot. Mm -hmm. how, how often does that happen where I send in my ballot, I've made some mistake on it, and the county electoral authority actually contacts me and asks and has me cure, uh, that is, fix the problem? So it should happen 100% of the time that you are contacted. Now, the follow through on actually curing it is a whole different story, but it should be that there's some mechanism that you are contacted, whether it is sending um, an email, a phone call, uh, sending a notice in the mail, et cetera. These days, you can uh, get text message alerts and sort of actually Amy had asked the question, which was, how can I find out if my absentee ballot has been, in fact, accepted or rejected? This is one thing that I will give credit to is that there is now a statewide your my yeah. voter page through the Secretary of State's office. You can look. So if you have requested a ballot, you can look on there to see whether or not it's been sent and you should have received it. You can look on there for information about your precinct and also sort of what districts you fall in, especially for the state level races. And once you send your ballot in, you can track if it's been received and also if it's been accepted. Uh, which seems great. Actually, I've, I've checked that out on mine, and I, it's something I really appreciate. Um, Savannah Boylan asks, do you believe that there is voter suppression in Georgia? Uh, and how might COVID-19 exacerbate this issue? And I'm not, I'll, whoever would like to answer that, I'll let, I'll let answer. I guess, it, there, I, I guess I'll, <laughs> Professor uh, Steigerwald, over to you. Concerns in the state of Georgia about voter suppression. There are obviously differing views about what exactly it means and how it plays out. Um, some of the question is sort of formal mechanisms that are designed sometimes to make it more difficult to vote. A lot of people have noted that exact match is one of those. And so while it may not be for example, an intentional thing designed to keep people from voting, it can make it harder. One of, uh, for example, there have been issues with exact match that your voter registration data is entered into a database. Well, what if they enter your information into the database incorrectly? Right. This can particularly occur when you have hyphenated last names or last names that might have uh, two words and a space in them. Uh, that can happen with middle initials, and so that can cause issues, or simply that somebody has mistyped something. Um, there are also sort of more broadly, it is true that there are, again, because there are decisions made by counties about where polling places are located, how many polling places there are, uh, the hours particularly of early voting and the ability to get to them. Um, there have been concerns raised, uh, particularly for example by the uh, ACLU, that sometimes those decisions are made in ways that might have a uh, racial bias to them, that we're more likely to see polling places in 
uh, majority white areas and less polling places in areas that have larger uh, black and brown communities that sometimes there are, um, that they're farther away, that they're less, uh, they're situated less closely to, for example, public transportation and things like that, as well as decisions about how many polling places there are. So those were a lot of the issues that came up uh, that were brought up by different groups and partly what also spurred um, Stacey Abrams' group of fair fight action. Right, but if I understand you correctly, the, the where the polling stations are located, where the precincts are located and closing a precinct or moving a precinct, that's, that's a county level decision, not a state level decision. Yes. Okay, here's a, a question from Rohit Verma. Um, and I think I'm gonna ask this to Neil. And he says, do you believe the action today by the president to hold back the stimulus package for purely electoral purposes is that constant? Is that constitutionally okay? Yes. So um, it may be that it's inconsistent with his oath. So I guess it, I guess the answer to your question depends on what you mean by is it constitutionally okay? No court is going to strike down or issue an injunction ordering the president to, in good faith, engage in negotiations. Um, but I do think it's fair to consider the president using um, tools at his, at, his disposable, at his disposal for partisan advantage to be inconsistent with his constitutional oath to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Um, it's also inconsistent with the constitutional injunction that the president recommend needful legislation, right? So if the president actually thinks this legislation is needful but withholds recommending it and withholds participating in the legislative process because he wants to seek a partisan advantage, an electoral advantage, right? It's certainly inconsistent then with his oath and with his duty, but not in any way that's actionable in court, right? No court is, is gonna say, um, Mr. President, you violated your oath and here is some penalty to, to impose upon you. Let me ask you a question the same way, a different way. People talk about a constitutional crisis. We're in a constitutional crisis. How do you know? You're the constitutional lawyer. How does, how, when are we in a constitutional crisis? What constitutes one? Yeah, that's a, it's a colloquial term. There's not an actual definition for that, I think, any more than there is for judicial activism, which is when you don't like a, a decision that a court has, has handed down. Um, I mean, I think a constitutional crisis. So if I were to give a working definition, I would say it's when the constitution is somehow being prevented from operating in the way it's supposed to operate, right? So, you know, when the president or Congress sort of uses their powers to achieve things they're not supposed to be able to achieve or to achieve advantages that they're not supposed to be able to achieve, I, you can call that a constitutional crisis. Um, but I tend to think it's just a characterization like judicial activism that we cast at a brand, at the president or at Congress when we don't like what they're doing. There are a couple of questions about how can I check is my um, absentee ballot been accepted? And I'll go back. There's a, on, on it's vote dot, Georgia vote dot com. Um, on the Secretary of State's site, they, each voter has a page. And on that page, you can check to see whether or not uh, your absentee ballot has been accepted. Amy uh, Steigerwald, let me, let me give you what I think is gonna be the last question. Democrats for years have been talking about, you know, Georgia can become a purple state. It's on the verge of becoming a purple. I mean, I've heard that so many times and you have too, you're getting very tired of it. But, Vice President Biden is, so far as I know, has not planned any visits to Georgia. He's not going to campaign in Georgia. Is he, does that mean the Democrats have written the state off? Um, I think the issue, though, that there's been a lot of possible campaign trips that are not happening right now mm -hmm. due to COVID, and so there's been a lot of change there. I think what we instead see are a lot of both the Biden campaign running a ton of ads in Georgia. In fact, doing ad buys that are sort of unprecedented for a Democratic candidate and 
perhaps even more tellingly, really large ad buys by Republicans in the state of Georgia. And so what that means is, is they feel a need to have to protect the state and turn out as many of their voters as possible. Um, I actually like to say that it's not that we're becoming a purple state, if that were a twist ice cream cone of blue and red, because each of the sides are sort of so over. So it's not really gonna become purple, but I think what we're seeing is that that twist is pretty equal of what's making up on each of it. Um, it definitely is sort of continuing to be uh, somewhat geographically distinct as well. But the fact that, for example, we are seeing um, a very close race for the Senate seat, particularly the first, the first Senate seat, sort of the, the original Senate seat of David Perdue versus John Ossoff, uh, that is incredibly close. Polling is suggesting, again, that uh, the presidential race is close. And so I think that there are, an, and a lot of seats which previously were in uh, congressional seats that were previously in congressional hands, both at uh, for Congress as well as for the state legislature are very much in play. And so that's actually what I would say for those of you who really wanna watch what's changing, if things are changing in Georgia, watch what happens to the general assembly seats. Okay. Watch what is happening to the seats, particularly in uh, the suburbs and exurbs to see whether or not those seats stay in Republican hands, or if we see either a decreased majority of the Republicans in the state house and Senate, or even a loss of control of one of the chambers. Um, I want to just, I guess that the last question ought to be, do you, do any of you want to make a prediction? How's, how's Georgia going to go in the presidential election in the two, in, in the senatorial seat one? Amy Baxter, you got a prediction? Not being a politician and being proven so wrong on so many elections, um, I, my prediction is that we are not finished with COVID-19 affecting our candidates. Um, Biden is actually was, Trump was likely infectious at the uh, debate as were his family who took their masks off. So Biden's got 14 days of exposure before he's technically in the clear. And Trump is right now on high dose steroids which make you manic, irritable and grandiose. And so COVID, the, the steroid mania is a real thing, and it's likely disguising the, the big pulmonary issues that happen day 10 to 14, which are going to start tomorrow till Sunday. So I think there's still a lot more medical stuff that could upend what happens in any of the states. So stay tuned. Mm -hmm. And Neil, you want to make uh, any predictions on the presidential race in Georgia or the senatorial seat one? I have no idea except to just sort of agree with what Amy was just saying, which is it's really, really close. And I have no idea which way it's going to come down. Amy, what's your, what's your political um, sense tell you? It's incredibly close. And I realize that political scientists say this constantly, but it's true. It's going to come out to turn out. Um, for those who are particularly interested, georgiavotes.com tracks absentee ballot requests and also once they get turned in and it tracks them uh, based on age, race, other demographics, as well as by counties. If we see incredibly high turnout, especially numbers that are larger than we've seen previously in 2018 in some of the more blue leaning counties as opposed to the red leaning counties that would sort of go obviously towards the Democrats, right? Though if you're watching that and we're instead seeing that turnout is more uh, in sort of the sort of Trump bastion, particularly sort of rural areas, exurbs, et cetera, then that would go the other way. And I think that's gonna be a huge deal. At the end of the day, um, people have to vote. So please go vote, please vote. You must already be registered, but please go vote. Go vote, that's, that's great advice. Amy Baxter, Amy Steigerwald, Neil Kincock, thank you so much. This was this was just great. This is the most fascinating 45 minutes I've spent in a very long time. Um, audience members, please send us an email if you think we ought to do this again. I think this is just great. I want everybody, if you don't belong to the World Affairs Council, please join and support fabulous programs like this. I've got two more coming up I want to tell you about. On October 15th, we have uh, New York Times White House correspondent Peter Baker and New Yorker White House correspondent, I'll try it again, New Yorker White House correspondent Susan Glasser, who are the 
authors of The Man Who Ran Washington, The Life and Times of James A. Baker III. That's on October 15th. On October 21st, we've got the Indian ambassador to the United States, Taranjit Singh Sandhu, talking about US and India strengthening our strategic partnership. Um, I want to thank Fernanda Lukine, our executive director, and Valerie Lopez de Frank, who is producer of this show. This has been great. Again, two Amy's and one Neil, thank you very much. This has just been great. I, I really appreciate it. appreciate your time and appreciate your sharing your views with us. Thank you all and good evening. <laughs>